I'm Jay Pitts, a real estate broker, agent, leader, and investor. For the last decade, I've navigated the craziest of real estate markets this country has ever seen, selling over 2,000 homes, moving in and out of markets, always ahead of the curve. And now I'm bringing that perspective to you. This is your resource, and Real Talk About Real Estate starts right now. And welcome back, folks, to Resource Real Talk about Louisville Real Estate. I am your host, Jay Pitts. We're back here on a Wednesday, like always, but this time it's just a little bit different. We are live in our private Facebook group. Hopefully, uh, those of you that have not been accustomed to seeing us live in the group lately, maybe you'll 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 join in and listen live today. It's one of the benefits to being in our private Facebook group is that you get to listen to these episodes live. Um, so I've got a treat for you today. Um, we've been trying to go guest heavy uh, for the last several episodes just because I feel like it's a great opportunity to uh, bring you a different perspective, right? Like this, this, this show is designed to bring you everything that's going on with Louisville real estate, market knowledge, coaching, training, uh, a little bit of experience from some of the most credible professionals in the industry, that kind of thing. But, um, you know, sometimes, um, you know, I've got a little bit of a message that I'd like to bring you to you directly. So today I am going to go through something I feel is very impactful. What is driving this particular message is the fact that I, I see both anecdotally and in proof here within our own brokerage, there are a lot of new folks to the industry here in Louisville. Okay. Um, 2020 COVID pandemic has had taken its toll on a number of sectors of the economy, uh, the and specifically sectors of the economy that typically have individuals that may um, may be like really well positioned with skills and qualities that would make them successful in real estate. So we've seen as the the service sector and the hospitality industries like hotels, like restaurants, entertainment venues, sales professionals surrounding all of those industries have looked to real estate as a successful alternative, an industry that they may have had interest in before, but now have, you know, all the incentive in the world to try their hand. So the, the market is robust. I have a set of skills that allows me to take advantage of you know a growing industry. So why not try my hand at real estate? So us as a company, we've 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 accepted uh, five seven licenses in the last week. Five on JT Pitts and Associates alone. We have several more committed to join by the end of the year. Our numbers are uh, exploding with individuals that we're really really excited about. So my message for today is in service of those particular market dynamics. What, I sat down and thought, what am I gonna talk to you about today? Um, what better than to examine the things that I wish I knew when I first started? And some of these actually, I guess maybe I did know because I grew up around the industry, but you know, I've mentored a lot of agents. I've mentored a lot of agents that have come from completely out of the industry, green as can be, to incredibly successful. What did what should they know? What are these five individuals that joined my team in the last seven days? Um, what should they know? And it didn't take very long to kind of scribble out a list. I'll show the camera for those of you that are watching. A list of 10 things that I think every agent should know. Uh, as Seth could attest, these, these uh, literally made it to paper in about 15 minutes prior to going live. Well, maybe 30 minutes, because it took us about 15 minutes to figure out how to go live. But we promise that we're getting better. Um, you know, technology is is our friend, but sometimes it's a little challenging. But uh, these things are thing, uh, they're ideas, they're theories, they're thoughts that swim around in my head all day, every day. I share them in one various form or fashion with our agents on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. 
Okay, so let's get started without further ado in no particular order. Um, maybe I saved a couple of the best for last. But number one, something that every real estate agent should know is that real estate school does not, need, does not teach you how to make money in real estate. What real estate school teaches you is how to pass a real estate state exam. It may teach you somewhat how to stay out of trouble once you become a licensed real estate professional. And it's important to understand the difference between a licensed real estate professional and a realtor. And yes, that is how you pronounce the word realtor. It's not realtor. Sorry for those of you that mispronounce. I hope, hopefully I'm not offending. I'm, a little, I'm feeling a little froggy today. I don't know if you guys can tell, but um, we'll see where this goes. So real estate school does not teach you how to make money in real estate. It teaches you how to pass the exam and hopefully how to stay out of trouble. Maybe you learn some textbook definitions that will serve you in your career at high, high level discussions, but real estate is a people business and it doesn't teach you how to help people, how to manage expectations, how to manage emotions, how to engage and interact and draw people into your sphere. Um, that's a word that we use quite a bit in real estate sphere, how to draw them in and help them place their trust in you. Okay. That's number one. Number two, 97 out of every 100 licensees are no longer in the real estate industry full time at the end of five years. We call that a failure rate. Some people call it an attrition rate. We call that a highly fluid industry is what it is with extremely low barriers to entry. Now, as long as you understand those barriers to entry, you can take advantage of them. Okay. I often talk about being a contrarian. Um, there's over 5,000 licensees in the city of Louisville and the greater Louisville association of realtors, 5,000, a grand percentage of those do not make a living in real estate. Okay, um, many of them that are in real estate don't don't make enough, you know, sufficient to to support their families in real estate. I'm going to come back that to to that in a minute, but but the thing that you need to understand that simultaneous to that five year time period that you're trying to make it beyond, the consumer tends to buy and sell real estate between five and seven years. The average expectancy for the amount of time that a, a homeowner lives in a home is between five and seven years, depending on what stat you trust. So what you need to understand is, is that when you're new to the industry, you tend to work buyers. Um, it's a hunting versus farming situation, and if you need me to elaborate on that later on, I can. But you place buyers in a property. It's buyers are easier to find because they, they raise their hand, right? The home that they're looking for is exciting to think about. Selling is not so exciting. So seller lead generation is challenging. Buyer lead generation is not so challenging. So you tend to sell more buyers early in your career. Think of those as seeds. You're planting a seed that's going to sprout in five to seven years. So what I want to illustrate before moving on, because I got a, a, you know eight more items to get through on this list today, is that when you make it past that five years and your year one clients that you sold as buyers be, come back ready to sell, you get typically a 400% raise on the amount of revenue that you can expect from servicing that one client. Okay, now how to, how is that possible, Jay? Okay, very simply. Let's say you sell a first time home buyer $150,000 house in year one. Okay, let's say by the end of five years, they call you back to come, to come help them. They're looking to get into the market again. You're looking to represent them as a seller first and a buyer second. Okay, let's stipulate that most most years homes go up in value and let's say over that five years the property that was worth 150,000 appreciated to 200 very reasonable expectation so most buyers and most most buy sells are typically move ups in in terms of price let's say they buy a $400,000 house also not not an unreasonable expectation well 
now you've taken a $150,000 buyer in year one and you've turned them into a $600,000 buy sell in year five. That is a 400% increase in revenue because again, we work on a percentage basis. They probably didn't teach you that in real estate school, but that might've been the one thing you knew before you even signed up for real estate school is that we get paid a percentage of the sales price typically 400% assuming the commission percentages stay the same. Moving on to number three, negotiating. It's all about leverage. Okay. Um, you'll hear it's spoken a number of ways. Um, you know, leverage is about who has the power at any one particular moment. Okay. How you exert that leverage is completely up to you. Can you underplay, overplay, or perfectly play your hand? Absolutely. Okay. Results depend on your ability to play that hand. Negotiating is about leverage. Understanding who has it in a transaction is incredibly important. Let's take, for example, now as a seller's market. It's a seller's market because there's more demand than there is supply. Very simple economics. So when a buyer makes an offer on a property, the seller has the leverage. They get to exert that leverage. Sales prices are typically at or above list price at moderate price points. The seller has leverage. But the second that property goes under contract and is secured by the buyer. The seller loses the leverage. Now the buyer has it because they have an inspection contingency and all other contingencies that the con contract must meet before closing happens. Okay. When the contingencies are released, the seller has the power again. Leverage swings like a pendulum back and forth. It also has consequences. How you use your leverage has consequences later in the transaction. How you use how you leave a buyer feeling about the home they just, just purchased from you as your listing has far-reaching implications because the transaction's not over. Certain terms of the contract survive the closing, and there is also liability that a seller and an agent have when they participate in a transaction. So don't overplay your hand. Play it just right. Number four, the closing experience in air quotes. God, I hate air quotes. The closing experience determines whether or not you get the referrals. You can do the best possible job that anyone could have ever done for 98% of the transaction. But if the closing is a you know what show, if it's a disaster, you're not getting referrals. You look like an amateur. You didn't manage the closing process. And now, and now I, I want to Again, this is literally 99% of the process happens before the closing table. Okay? Take your pick. Pre-qualifying, consultation, showings, lender consults, you know, more showings, contract offer, rejection, multiple offer, escalation clauses, accepted offer, um, inspections, inspection negotiations, contingency releases, appraisals, title work, more lender communication, um, you know, a, a negotiation if the appraisal comes in light. You can hit a home run at every step of the way for your client. And if there is a fight at the closing table because the seller uh, you know, took the shelving unit in the garage that they were supposed to leave or that your clients have thought they were supposed to leave, even unjustly. Um, your client's going to be left with a bad taste in their mouth and you're not going to get the referrals. Now, on the converse, regardless of how fair or unfair it may be, those problems are an opportunity for you to rise above even the level of service that you have provided prior, which was impeccable in this example, that problem is an opportunity. I will say that your income is directly proportionate to your ability to solve problems. The bigger the problem you can solve, the more money you're, you're going to make. That, that is a universal truth. All right. Number five. Very simply put, Going back to the stay out of trouble discussion that maybe you learned a little bit of that in real, school, real estate school. Very simply put, people don't sue people they like. Very simple. So where is your risk as a real estate professional? I feel like a lot of people, real estate school does a sufficient job at scaring the wits out of would-be real estate professionals. 
um, you know, you come out with a with this feeling that you have to document every decision you make, every communication, you have to provide a disclaimer that is, you know, this long in your email sig underneath your email signature, so that people understand that you can't be blamed for this or that or the other. Um, you know, you think that the the general consumer is out to get you. That is not the case. The general consumer is scared out of their wits with this process and wants someone to make it feel easy to make them feel safe, okay? And people don't sue people they like. So if you build great rapport, if you leave them liking you, um, they don't sue you. When something goes wrong, they won't assume it's your fault, okay? They'll ask you to consult with them, provide them with opportunities, provide them with context that helps them understand whether they should or shouldn't be upset. This is what the best do. Um, and if I were a new agent, I'd really want somebody to tell me that. All right. People don't sue people they like. Number six, I'm going to get a little blue here for a moment. Thankfully we don't have to, we're a podcast and we don't have to answer to the FCC. So I will say when a dispute arises and it will, you need to understand that the biggest asshole always wins. Um, I suppose that goes mostly to a contractual dispute. But any dispute, frankly, um, the person who is willing, I can restate that, the person who is willing to be the biggest asshole usually wins. And it kind of goes back to that whole leverage point that I made earlier because everything is a negotiation, especially a dispute. Okay? Who is willing to say the thing that no one else is willing to say. Who is willing to be direct in their communication? Who is willing to be forceful and strong, whether they have a point or not? Of course, it's always better when you have the facts on your side. But unfortunately, force wins over facts in a lot of cases. That's the truth. Um, we shouldn't whine about it. We shouldn't be frustrated. I mean, you're allowed to be frustrated. It's just not going to get you where you want to go. Um, the important thing is to kind of go back to uh, number three and say, understand leverage, okay? And understand when, when force is on your side and understand when, you know, I, I'll also say the best thing you can ever do with a bully is punch him in the mouth. And, and, and I, I'd say... I would say that in most circumstances, I'm, you know, that's figurative, but sometimes, sometimes I might, I guess I'm could possibly be literal as well. So, um, you know, know when the facts are on your side, because then your force will definitely help you win. Number seven, flexibility may be why you chose this career. I hear a lot that, you know, the ability to make my own schedule. Why did you pick real estate? Why real estate? Um, well, you know, I just, uh, you know, I want to be, I want to be, uh, you know, flexible. I want to, I want to, I want to, I don't want to no two days to be the same. Well, number one, I will say that you're searching for a career that does not exist. Every career requires you to figuratively break rocks some days. Okay. Doing things you don't like to do. Real estate isn't all sunshine and rainbows. It can be emotionally draining uh, physically exhausting, and, you know, it's not complex, but it isn't easy either, okay? There's a difference between complex complexity and simplicity, and there's a difference between hard and easy. And, uh, you know, there is, a, there is an inverse relationship there as it pertains to real estate. Flexibility may be why you chose this career, but it'll also be why you fail if you're not capable of managing it. Now, what does that mostly look like? It mostly looks like your schedule. You know, being more rigid with control of your schedule than any boss in a W-2 salaried hourly position would require of you. Okay? You are your own boss, and you're harder to please than the one you had in your prior job. That's what makes success in real estate. Okay. 
flexibility may be why you chose it, but it'll also be why you fail if you don't if you don't manage it properly. Number eight, most agents. You can read that as 51%. It might even be a super majority since we're all talking about politics these days. Um, a substantial percentage of real estate agents are one transaction a year from being out of the business. Okay. So what does that mean? That means that I could probably in, I could do a blind selection of one real estate agent out of a pool of all the real estate agents in the marketplace and ask that person how many real estate transactions they closed in the last year. I'll give you a hint. The average is really low, but let's give them the benefit of the doubt and say it was 12. That's way higher than the average. If I change that, if I wave a magic wand and make 12 into 11, they probably have to go get a day job. This is why it pays to be a contrarian. Okay. Um, when you're different than everyone else, your results are different than everyone else's. Number nine. And these last two, I told you I might have been saving something special for you toward the end. Um, all of the first eight are incredibly important. But um, these, I think, will really, really hit home. On a positive note, the best agents never worry about the money. Now, you might say that's easy because they make a lot of it. You're right. The best real estate agents in the marketplace do make a lot of money. Um, but what I'll submit to you is the reason they make a lot of money is they don't worry about it, not the opposite. You following me? It's not the fact that they can afford not to worry about it because they do make a lot. It's that they do make a lot because they don't, they choose not to worry about it. That's the truth. When I got in this business very early on, my father, who is a mentor of mine and a very successful real estate agent in his own right, and if you're a listener, the, listener of this podcast, scroll back about 50 episodes and you'll find you'll find an episode I recorded with my dad you'll you'll you may even remember if you're a longtime listener we had a uh, stuff my dad says real estate version um, real estate edition of this podcast that was one of our episodes it was pretty it was pretty fun to have dad here anyway so he told me that if you never worry about the money the money will take care of itself and there are no truer words ever spoken about a career in real estate. You are handling an intensely personal endeavor on behalf of each and every one of your clients. Now, no, you're not a principal to those, those transactions. You're not you know, a party that, um, that has to perform you know, or there is some sort of potential liability or lawsuit. Your your fiduciary duty to your client is is not you know one of a bilateral contract between a buyer and a seller. You you know obviously owe them certain things, but um, you're not the one in the contract. You're not the one buying or actually selling the home. But but you're curating this process for them. You know, and if you're doing it right, and you tell your clients to jump, they say how high. Um, that's how much control you have of the situation if you're doing it right. So my advice to you, regardless of how hard it is, because financially this business can be very tough in the beginning of your career. You know, you're, you know, I don't know any other industries where you're expected to give 100% effort with no expectation of income at any point directly, but even more likely, and if you're talking in a subjective sense, you're probably looking at no paycheck for three months in most cases. And that first paycheck is not going to be as much as you would like. And neither is the second and third and fifth and twelfth. But if you can somehow make it pass, like I told you in number two, make it past five years, you get a 400% pay raise. Don't worry about the money. 
If you do worry about the money, you have what we call commission breath, and there is nothing that will turn a potential client off faster than the than the intrinsic understanding that the person that has their largest investment in the palm of their hands is only worried about what they're going to get as a result. If you give your give of yourself with no mention of income, and this manifests in a lot of ways, you know, a good friend of mine, an agent here, Tracy French, um, made a great example of this in one of our trainings the other day where she she literally called from the closing table a junk man and paid $300 via Venmo to get him to go to a house that they were sitting at the closing table for when a buyer was threatening to walk away because the seller left behind a load of trash. Now, they probably shouldn't have left the trash and the buyer probably shouldn't have threatened to walk over it. But Tracy snapped into action and paid $300 in, out of her own bank account. Like, with no notice whatsoever to ensure that a transaction moved forward. And guess what? It still didn't close. And you know what? She didn't ask her clients to reimburse her either. Okay. But she held on to the listing, sold it to somebody else for more money. And now they're going to refer her probably 10 times over. And that $300 is the greatest investment that she could have ever made. So don't worry about the money. And when you don't, it'll take care of itself. All right. Number 10, last but not least, And those, those of my agents that are listening to this episode right now um, are probably going to chuckle when they hear me start this explanation, but it's because I say it all the time. Under no circumstance, regardless of how much you feel like you should, absolutely, positively do not apologize for something that is not your fault. Again, you're working in an intensely personal process, a transaction that means more financially to your client than anything they've ever done before, okay? They're relying on you, and if you're a good person, which all of you are, you're going to feel it. I often say that the I'm rubber, you're glue situation from elementary school really authentically applies to real estate because you will be, you will be that glue, you you will you will affix yourself to every positive and every negative circumstance that happens throughout an entire transaction that will be your urge if you're not careful or if you're early in your career and you don't know any better it will you'll feel it like you'll feel like you've been kicked in the stomach when your client gets done wrong in a transaction and the and and the most natural words to say when you feel that feeling in the pit of your stomach is i'm so sorry but it's also the worst thing you could say because it's not your fault. You can't control every circumstance. Your clients don't expect you to. And unfortunately, when you apologize for something that's not your fault, you give them permission to blame you for it because they remember, they don't know how this works. You do, or you're supposed to. And so, Regardless of how it feels, choose a different word. I hate that that happened. You know, this is highly irregular. You know, I've seen this once or twice maybe before, but it's really not typical, and I hate that you're going through it. And it may seem, may seem like there's just this infinitesimal difference between those two choices of words. But trust me, they matter. They matter a lot. Okay. I can't say this with any more impact than I am right now. Okay. I can't highlight it anymore. If you learn nothing else of today's list of 10, remember don't apologize for things that aren't your fault. Okay. You know, I'll probably take a little caveat to that as well. You'll have a need, you'll feel it. You'll feel that need just like you feel the need to apologize, to justify to your clients by telling them that you're doing your best for them. Um, and, and no offense to you or your feelings, but nobody cares if you're doing your best or not, especially if you feel the need to say it. So 
People care about results, okay? And it's the same point. It's the same. It's the converse of the fact that they don't expect you to apologize for things that aren't your fault. But a second you do, you've assumed responsibility for them. So your actions will always speak louder than your words, okay? It's, but it's important to show empathy too. Just do it in a way that is professional, right? Do it in a way that's professional and assuming responsibility or telling someone that you've done your best for them as a means you know, of showing empathy for things that have gone wrong, that's not the professional they want, okay? That's the, that's, the, that's the answer they get from the agent who's one deal from being out of the business. So, in summation, there's a lot of things that you're going to learn if you're new on this journey. And for those of you that have been at this a while, I hope this was a, I hope this was a valuable refresher, okay? Um, short and sweet episode today. I'm not going to go at length as um, into these things as you all know if you've listened to this podcast that I can. Um, but reflect. I'm going to hit them one more time really quickly before we adjourn today. One, real estate school doesn't teach you how to make money. Two, 97 out of 100 fail and you get a 400% increase in year five if you hang on and white knuckle it past that deadline. Three, negotiating is all about leverage and understanding who has it. Number four, the closing experience is what generates the referrals. If you if you fumble on the five yard line, okay, you don't get to dance in the end zone. Number five, people don't sue people they like, so make people like you. Number six, the biggest asshole always wins. Please don't forget that. Number seven, flexibility may be why you chose this career, but it'll also be what gets you out of the business if you don't mind your schedule. Number eight, most agents are one transaction from being out of the business. So go get one extra and start eliminating your competition in the process. Number eight, or excuse me, number nine, the best agents don't think about the money, so you shouldn't either. And number 10, please, 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 if you learn nothing else, don't apologize for things that aren't your fault. That's all for, all for today, folks. It's Wednesday, October 21st. Back live in the Facebook group. Tell your friends. As always, please subscribe and leave five-star reviews only. No, I'm just joking. I'll appreciate a four-star review, but five is what I would really prefer. So if you like me, then hopefully you'll do that for me. If you've done it already, please try again. I'm not sure if iTunes will allow it, but uh, I'm willing to try. And um, we'll be back here every Wednesday with another episode. Maybe guest next week, maybe not. You're not sure. I'm not either. Um, but I sure do uh, enjoy helping in the way that I can. Again, my name is Jay Pitts. I'm your host of Resource Real Talk about Louisville real estate. We'll see you again soon.